If you've ever been to the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Pete, you might have heard the story about one of Dali's muses, Narcissus. After reading a poem about him and studying this mythological subject in 1937, Dali painted the metamorphosis of Narcissus. You can even buy a print of it. I did when I was a college student and hung it on my dorm room wall. But unfortunately for us, who live so close to the Dali Museum in St. Pete, the original is in the Tate Collection in London. In oil painting on canvas, Dali used a meticulous technique that he described, maybe a little narcissistically himself, as hand-painted color photography to depict a hallucinatory effect on the transformation of Narcissus. It's been said that the theme of Narcissus played well with Dali's fascination with hallucination and delusion. And it really is a fascinating painting, like much of Dali's work, especially once you learn the backstory from Greek mythology. Narcissus was an extraordinarily handsome, yet cold and vain youth from Greece. Narcissus didn't love anybody but himself and judged that he was the only one worth loving. One day, when he was sitting near a fountain with his big eyes, he noticed a beautiful gaze, face gazing at him from the water source. Charmed by the beauty he saw, he wanted to plunge his arm into the water to capture it. However, despite his efforts, the reflection remained in the same position until finally the young man suffered a decline and died. Shortly after his death, a white flower with a faint smell grew in that location, bearing his name as a symbol of decay in the underworld the Narcissus flower. Now, Narcissus' ultimate concern was himself, for that reflection of himself. That's what this whole story is about. You've heard of the Narcissistic Personality Disorder. This is the character that it's named after. It involves a pattern of self-centered, arrogant thinking and behavior, a lack of sympathy and consideration for other people, and an excessive need for admiration. Narcissus' ultimate concern was himself. And as Lutheran theologian Paul Tillich explained so well in his books of systematic theology, that made Narcissus his own god, his own idol. That which one is concerned with the most is the god that we worship. For people like Narcissus, there was no greater concern than the self, no greater God than the self. And while this might sound far-fetched or something that only touches the far reaches of humanity, in truth, according to St. Paul, we all struggle with this. It's one of the effects that sin has on us. It's actually one of the main themes that runs through the letter to the Romans that we've been reading here in church on Sundays lately, and that we're studying right now in our Thursday morning Bible study. If we go back from where we are today in Romans and look at the very first chapter, we'll read that ever since the creation of the world, God's eternal power and divine nature, invisible though they are, have been understood through the things God has made. So they are without excuse. For though they knew God, they did not honor God as God or give thanks to God, but they became futile in their thinking, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise like the builders of the golden calf, maybe, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal human bodies. In short, Humans became the focus of the world to humans. We see ourselves as the ultimate concern. And so today, Paul reels us back in to hopefully help us to repent from this idolatry of self, from the narcissistic tendencies that we all have. 
And to do so, he asks some questions to help us think about it. He says, why do you pass judgment on your brother or your sister? Or why do you despise your brother or your sister? Paul helps us to remember that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God and that we are not the judge of our brothers and sisters. When we usurp that right, we are usurping a right that belongs solely to God. Now we all judge. I hope we can admit that. It's just that Paul reminds us that we shouldn't. And it isn't just something little when we do judge another person. It's the most selfish, narcissistic thing in the world. And by doing so, we are doing nothing less than turning ourselves into idols and trying to steal something that belongs to God. I'd like to offer you another way to understand the idea of judgment. And I'm talking end of time, judgment day stuff. The promise of God's judgment might not be so much about inducing fear or a threat to make sure that we change, like so many people think. The Bible's teaching of God's judgment is a lot simpler and graceful than that. Judgment is about helping us to learn that judgment is not our right. Judgment is the right of God alone. Now the most attractive and maybe most dangerous idol is worship of self. It's so easy to do. We all want our opinion to be right, and even beyond that, we set them up as the plumb line or the square from which we judge others. We enjoy becoming the standard by which we judge everything else. But the problem with this is that we are not God, and that when we do this, we are breaking the very first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. This self-worship stuff is definitely not something to take lightly. As some Christians point out, it comes from pride, something that Narcissus was filled with, and it is the root of all evil. And like Narcissus, it kills all who comfortably sit in it. When we judge one another, we are doing nothing less than making ourselves God. Nothing less than usurping God's throne and God's right to judge. When we judge others, we worship ourselves and our personal opinions, placing our decisions and ideas on false pedestals, looking down at others and seeing them less than I. And we judge people all the time. Sure, we've been trained to do it so well that we probably don't even think about it much anymore. We've pretty much justified it in our modern world. We judge people about their political opinions, not even so much looking at the opinion anymore or trying to put ourselves in their shoes. But if they don't agree with us, then we place them into a category that we're okay hating. They're fools, or something with a much less desirable title. And we judge all the time, whether we want to admit it or not. We judge people on their clothes, cars, and just about anything and everything we ourselves are insecure about. And why do we do this? Real fear, I think. I don't believe that we judge others in their decisions because we're worried about the other person, even though we probably try to justify it this way. We do this stuff out of sinful, selfish pride, and the real concern we have is whether or not we've made the right decision. But it's a cop-out to justify our own decisions by just claiming that the other person made a wrong one. And it's childish, to say the least, yet all of us do it. All of us. We've been taught to be hypercritical of others and even ourselves. But I ask you, what if, what if we focus that attention on witnessing to the divine, to the divine, that we have no right to criticize in this world? 
What if we focused on God, making God our ultimate concern and saw the presence of God in any, everybody and anybody and everything, like our Lutheran theology teaches us to do? What if we set aside what we've learned and teach the next generation to focus on the good in each other and in ourselves? Would the world be better off? You know it would. I will warn you that when we focus on criticizing others so as to not have to do the personal work of addressing our real underlying problems with why we judge, I warn you that this inevitably leads to the extreme of not only demonizing the other, but demonically raising ourselves to false deity or idol. We teach ourselves to justify our judgments, and we turn those we disagree with into enemies. Being hypercritical, taking the judgment that belongs to God alone and claiming it as our own right does nothing less than turn us into our own demonic idols that set aside the worship of God for self-praise. The story of Narcissus is clear. If we spend our lives living as if our opinions and good looks and possessions are the most important things, anything we use to define ourselves beyond child of God, then we will perish. Paul Tillich is clear. Our ultimate concern is our God. It all too often replaces the one and only God. And St. Paul is clear too. We are sinful people, in need of salvation, every single one of us. And the part of us that idolizes self hates that. We want to be the one who doesn't need God. We want to be the one that is always right. I mean, we're so close as a society to believing that truth is completely subjective, just so that we never have to claim again that we are ever wrong. And if that's not trying to judge ourselves as omniscient gods, then I don't know what is. But the Bible offers us another way in Jesus Christ. St. Paul tells us, do not judge. Instead, spend your time in gratitude to God. Do not judge. We are all equal to God, and the only thing above any of us is God, and that gives God alone the right to judge. To set oneself up to be judged is yet another form of idolatry. If you wouldn't worship another god, then don't judge, because that is self-worship. It's the Word of God alone that is able to get through to us, even through the sin of narcissism and pride. Whisper it into our ears as we unwittingly stare into the reflective pools of personal praise. It is the Word of God alone that can get through and pull us up before we drown or die of starvation, like Narcissus did. And may we all hear that quiet voice the next time we sit down to judge, either others or ourselves. In Jesus' name. Amen.